Welcome! You are listening to Audio from the Table. If you'd like to learn more about our community or donate to this ministry, please visit thetabletx.com. Grace and Peace Table Podcast listeners, Brett here. So glad to be with you all. We are in part five in our series titled, The Bible Doesn't Say That. We've been reflecting on uh, various phrases, kind of both within and outside the church that um, we can call them like bumper sticker theology. They're these little quotes um, that sound like they're from the Bible when they are, you know, in actuality, not at all. And as we've been going through the series, I've noticed it's almost always a matter of like interpretation and, and application. In other words, the statements, like they, they usually contain some kernel of truth, but of course the devil's in the details, you know? Um, we kind of have to ask like, what, what do you mean when you say that? How, how does that actually apply in life? Um, and often it's been in the interpreting, in the applying, um, that these statements we kind of have seen that they're like, ooh, at times downright toxic or at best, sort of, um, cli- you know, theological cliches and such. So with that in mind, um, our topic this week in the title of the message is The Lord Helps Those Who Help Themselves. <laughs> this one's, um, this is like a little bit old timey. I feel like people used to say this a lot. I don't know if someone maybe 15 years old is listening to this. They're like, what? <laughs> maybe, I don't know. Maybe this isn't really in the culture anymore. But um, it certainly was when I was growing up. And uh, so we'll, we'll kind of unpack this a bit. Um, I want to start, though, with our scripture, which we'll return to um, later in the message. But just to kind of frame this up, I want you to, to hear it now. So it's Matthew 16, uh, verses 24 through 27. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. So the year was 1859, and the author, Samuel Smiles, which, by the way, sounds like the most fake name of all time. <laughs> Surely this was not his real name. Like, this has got to be a pen name, right? Um, I mean, if it, if it was his real name, the man's name was his destiny. Because he wrote a book in a genre that today is worth billions of dollars. This industry is crazy. Um, but the book was titled simply Self-Help with Illustrations of Character and Conduct. And here is the opening lines of chapter one of this book. Smiles wrote, Heaven helps those who help themselves. This is a well-tried maxim, embodying in a small compass the results of vast human experience. The spirit of self-help is the root of, of all genuine growth in the individual and exhibited in the lives of many, it constitutes the true source of national vigor and strength. Help from without, um, in other words, he means like from outside of ourselves, is often enfeebling in its effects, but help from within invariably invigorates. So, I think that's a pretty good summation of the self-help movement. But let's kind of fast forward this way of thinking 150 years or so. And that brings us to our own day and to the um, podcaster and writer Tim Ferriss. Um, His name might be familiar to to many of you. He's quite a famous um, author who jumped relatively early on the the podcasting bandwagon as well. Um, He now has one of the most popular podcasts in the world, The Tim Ferriss Show. Um, But Ferriss began his career as really the the master of self-optimization and what's known as the quantified self movement, um, which for the uninitiated, basically it's... um, it's like the self-help movement on steroids. It's an approach to the self that's very data-driven, 
um, very results oriented. It emphasizes productivity and efficiency in every aspect of one's life, not just, um, uh, like professionally, but I mean, anything, you know, from dating and relationships to sexuality to, um, hobbies. I mean, just, you know, learning things, just anything. It's just this very efficient, um, productive data-driven approach. And you can see that in the titles of his books, the four hour work week, the four hour body, the four hour chef. And of course, strangely, the irony is, um, Ferris never worked four hours a week or only four hours a week in his life. Um, he's quite a workaholic. And my hunch is most people who read his books off or, you know, also don't just work four hours a week. Um, because even if it's kind of unintended, it seems that that kind of where this self-help, self-optimization world naturally tends to go is basically asking this question, how can I cram more things into my day? How can I squeeze every last second of productivity out of this moment? So you kind of begin by like making things more efficient, but of course you don't take the time saved and then, you know, become a like super reflective deep person. Um, no, of course not. Instead, you the idea is now you can do even more. And then you get even more efficient. And then you can do even more and even more. It's sort of endless. And so it seems to me, however Samuel Smiles meant to the phrase, heaven helps those who help themselves, in at least the way it's kind of taken on life in American culture, like this is where it's gone. This was its inevitable end game. A, a sort of overemphasis on the thinking, rational mind to the almost total neglect of the feeling, emotional, intuitive, artistic, spiritual aspects of ourselves. Um, the way one writer recently put it, his name's Adi Ashante, um, or Shanti, um, he said this, so many are tied and bound to themselves that they cannot stop running from here to there and back again. Always on the lookout for something more, different, or better. They cannot see that they are getting nowhere at all. And they are getting nowhere faster and faster with more and more ingenuity all the time. <laughs> Is that not such a perfect description of our modern age? It's, it's like... We can see where we are headed is a dead end, a brick wall, but we keep hurtling towards it and trying to figure out how we can get there more efficiently. Um, I mean, it's a problem. Now, to his credit, unlike Samuel Smiles, who I suspect probably ended his life believing that if only he could help people become more productive and efficient, then the vast majority of you know all social ills would be solved. Um, Ferris, to his credit, he's, he's kept evolving. In an interview in recent years with GQ magazine, um, he acknowledged um, this this kind of pivot in his life that he's he's begun to open up about his struggle um, and, and really kind of an ongoing struggle. But back in college, he struggled with suicidal ideation. Um, in the years since then, he's had um, kind of some bipolar mood swings and has struggled with depression. And he still recognizes that you know learning to be efficient like that's fine as far as it goes. But in this, this magazine um, interview, um, he had this to say, it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter how effective or efficient you are. It doesn't matter what types of fancy toys you collect. It doesn't matter how hot your significant other is. If your inner world, your internal monologue or dialogue is that of anger or despair, or frustration, or sadness the majority of the time. Almost none of these other things matter very much. In fact, you can't wield money or time effectively. You can't deepen relationships, repair relationships, de-escalate instead of escalate conflict, unless you have a certain degree of self-awareness, emotional resilience, and emotional acceptance. You might say that Ferris seems to have been on a, a journey of integration, trying to bring together the head and the heart. And this, I think, is the danger of our little phrase to, 
today. When people say, the Lord helps those who help themselves, what they seem to have in mind is this whole way of being that is focused on outward forms of success and self-improvement to the almost total neglect of the inward person, the, the inward journey of the heart. And this brings us back to our scripture. Then Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 16, starting verse 24 again, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. That's a key phrase. And take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world? Think of Tim Ferriss, right? And yet forfeit their soul. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. That this passage, it would really be worth spending some time with this week. Um, Matthew 16, 24 through 27. And just like take some time to sit with it. But I do want to, I'll take a few minutes now though to kind of unpack it. So Jesus says that his followers, they must deny themselves. I know this isn't a, a popular statement. I do think it's misinterpreted in the sense like, I wonder if we, when we hear that, if we hear sort of a, like Jesus encouraging us to, you know, deny yourself every little pleasure. Like, do you like dark chocolate? Well, don't you dare take a bite of that dark chocolate. Deny yourself. You know? um, I, no, no, I don't think that's what Jesus is getting at. I think it's much deeper and more profound than that. I, I think it's about saying no to this, this kind of self-helpy, um, the Lord helps those who help themselves mentality. This, this ego-driven, competitive, surface kind of restless mind self that is constantly seeking to, as Jesus says, gain the whole world. In other words, that part of us that wants to be an outward, external success where people look at us and they say, wow, what a winner. <laughs> and, you know, again, that's what the self-help industry tends to be about, right? It's about like how to have the life You've always dreamed, you know, but the question is, what are those dreams? I mean, is it, yes, the life you've always dreamed to live simply and with great love? You know, no, that's not, those aren't the dreams. Like, what are the dreams? They're, they're consumeristic and materialistic, right? It's, it's more fancy vacations and promotions and status symbols and having your dream for our body and feeling like a winner every day, you know? Um, what this is like, it's almost like an idolatry of the self. It's, but it's empty. It's empty as Adi Ashanti was naming earlier. We're just hurtling towards this dead end. And, and so it seems Jesus is inviting us to die to those things rather than trying to, quote, save our life, as Jesus said, um, or grasp, in other words, grasp or cling to these little pleasures of life, all the things that an American civil religion mindset of the Lord helps those who help themselves, you know, endlessly pursues. Jesus says, no, 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 stop it. Die to those things. Stop this ego-driven mania. Stop this acquisitive, greedy, competitive, comparing mania. And instead, gain your soul. Gain your soul. Because it isn't just about a, ne a negative no. You know, or like, hey, you want to be happy and have a wonderful, successful life? Stop it. Don't you dare. That's not what Christianity is about. <laughs> like, no, that's, that's the whole point is that that doesn't work. It's a, that's a sort of empty thing. And so instead, Jesus is inviting us to gain our very soul, which when some people hear that, maybe what they hear is go to heaven after you die. And to that, I would say like, well, yeah, but it's, it's, it's about experiencing the abundant life of Christ here and now as well, right? We die to that small self so that we might come alive in the spirit, so that we might truly flourish, so that we might actually have 
a, a moment of peace and joy. And sure, it, we may not be maximizing our earning potential, but my goodness, like I'll take the trade because we're becoming deeper, peaceful people of great love. Because that's what it's about anyway, right? And when Christ returns or when we die and enter the life to come, as verse 27 names, we will be rewarded based on what we have done, how we have lived, what we have pursued. Notice the reward here. It's not about like, so who has the most square footage in their home or who had the largest 401k or who has the most outward Instagram perfect family or the most externally envious TikTok of a life. Like, no, no, that's called a, the Lord helps those who help themselves mindset. Um, That's called trying to gain the whole world. No, we will be rewarded for how in Christ did we have become. In other words, how much did the person of Jesus find room in us? How much did we die to that old self and come alive? to our deep self. How surrendered to the Holy Spirit were we? Not how self-helped we were, but how self-forgetful we were. Perhaps we could sum it all up like this. Western culture is trying endlessly to improve our ego-driven, competitive, small self. Christianity is an invitation to die to that self so that we can come alive to our deep self, hidden with Christ in God. Years ago, um, at my last church community, I preached a message, you know, in ways not too different from this one. Um, It was about how our culture often thinks that life is all about onward and upward, um, when God's invitation to us is often downward and inward. Um, in other words, like in, it's about an inner processing and healing, right? To make us people of great love as we've been talking about. But, you know, I will admit this is like people seem to, I don't know if it's misunderstand or get very disheartened by this message. And I even wonder how people, you know, how you've heard this, like, do you hear kind of a liberating invitation, um, to a new way of living or do you just hear like such a sad, like, oh man, I got to die, you know, like this is kind of negative. So anyway, I'm at you know, this last church and I preached a, a kind of, you know, a similar sermon, different language, but similar spirit of it. And this gentleman um, from our congregation, a man who really by all outward appearances was just a picture of um, success, you know, just a total onward and upward kind of guy, tall and handsome and nice house and beautiful family um, and children and wife and unfailingly polite. Um, they just like, geez, they just had it all going, you know. Um, but he came up to me after I preached a message in and, and this message. And he said, like, ooh, I'll, I'll be honest, that was really depressing. <laughs> Which I don't usually get that. Like people, if they don't like the message, usually they just don't say anything, you know, <laughs> or give me a kind of gentle rebuke. Um, but th- I would never, I don't think I'd ever heard someone say like that message was depressing. <laughs> and, uh, he's like, I don't get it. <laughs> he said, I usually get your sermons, but not that one. That was a miss for me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, you know, I mean, it's, whatever. That's cool. That's cool, man. That's cool. You know, it's not, not every sermons for everyone, you know, whatever. But then years later, his um, wife called me and said they were getting a divorce. Um, she said he had a very severe drinking problem that he'd kept hidden from people for years. Um, he was verbally, at times physically, abusive um, to her. And my mind like immediately shot back to that interaction with him about that specific sermon. Now, it's possible, maybe it really was just a not very well-delivered sermon. Maybe I overemphasized the negative too much or something. You know, okay, fair enough. But maybe, just maybe, he was someone who had really perfected this kind of self-help, outward, external, present well kind of life, you know? But it was a mask to cover a certain struggle and brokenness within 
a brokenness that he just he could not face. And I, and I don't say that in like a shaming way. I mean, we all have that brokenness. We all have these struggles. I mean, who in the modern world hasn't struggled with some sort of addiction? Who? The, but the problem is um, we don't feel safe or we don't, we don't receive Jesus' invitation to get real and honest. We, we don't break through into a different kind of Christ-centered life. Instead, we're, we're stuck, kind of going nowhere faster and faster all the time. And, you know, maybe you can relate to, to this man's story. And I would just say, here's the good news. Are you still breathing? Well, then, friends, it's not too late. <laughs> like, hooray, it is never too late to make a U-turn. And so let's do it. Let's stop living in this kind of self-obsessed, driven, you know, God will be with me if only I pull myself up by my bootstraps and I'm perfect. You know, like, let, let's just let all that go and let's come alive. Let's come alive in Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.